What is up, cool cats of the interwebs? It is your girl, Haley, back at it again with another episode of your favorite podcast, The Pre-Review Crew. Now, like always, I'm going to introduce my gang that I have with me to discuss the games coming out uh, in September and the games that we talked about for August. Uh, to start it off, we have Brennan. Yo. And we have Mike. So. So to go back, um, we are going to kick it all the way back to July because the last time we recorded Blackout Protocol did not have any review scores. And honestly, it still doesn't. Uh, so to give you a little refresher, it's Blackout Protocol. It's a top-down shooter, single, and multiplayer game developed and published by Ocean Drive Studio, Inc. It came out on PC on July 19th, and currently it only has three reviews, critic reviews, so it's not generating any sort of top critic average or critics recommending percentage. Um, yeah, from what I'm, you know, I'm looking at this and they're saying it's aight. Um, one person says decent. Another person says it's fun to play, but you need friends in order for it to be fun. We don't have friends. Then you are not going to have fun with this. Oops. <laughs> I'm not going. I'm not going to lie. I don't even remember us talking about this game ever. Who picked this? I don't remember this. Did I pick this? I think you picked this. God damn it! Dude. <laughs> This game is so unmemorable that I just don't. It's so <laughs> mediocre like, that I just don't remember. Like, I don't even remember this trailer. I'm watching the trailer now. And I'm like, no, this doesn't even look familiar at all. I mean, yeah, like even looking at a trailer, I feel like you, you just kind of tell. I mean, that's what this whole thing is, right? And we have to go back. We have to go back in time. What did we say about this? I don't remember. It's been so long that I can't remember. Well, and even if it wasn't, I wouldn't have remembered anyway because this game kind of... Whatever. So, based on what Brennan says, he picks bad games. No. That's about it. I mean, every, I, not every game that I'm going to pick is a banger, 10 out of 10, you know, prize-winning game of the year. Every game that I pick definitely is. Okay, no, because we're going to talk about a game you picked <laughs> in a little bit, all right? Okay, hey, hey, that game didn't do too bad. Those scores are average. Anyway, let's kick it off to a game that I think no one is surprised about, but we are also surprised about, that I know is going to take up a lot of time. In today's podcast, we are talking about Baldur's Gate 3. I was expecting some clapping, but okay. Uh, it is a role-player, single, and multiplayer game published and developed by Larian Studios. It came out on PC and is shortly coming out on the PS5 um, in a couple days. And, bum ba da bum uh... Per Twitter, there was a meeting between Larry and Studios and Phil Spencer at Xbox. Eventually, it will be coming out sometime this year on the Xbox Series S and X. Currently, as for review scores, it has a top critic average of 97% uh, or 97 with 100% of critics recommending. Oh, we did it. <laughs> oh, um, uh, pause it currently has a 96 top critic average it went down one point whoever made it go down one point your mom's a hoe i, yeah, I agree a, with that yeah um i'm not gonna lie uh i haven't played it yet which is a that's war crime a war in crime itself. yeah as i was saying which is a war crime in itself but from what i'm seeing and what i'm hearing about this game um I thought Zelda Tears of the Kingdom was going to be, you know, game of the year. Um, but it looks like it's having some good competition in Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, I was watching my brother play it, and it just... Just the options and, you know, the stuff he can do in this game is just ridiculous. 
it really feels like uh, there's, I feel like there's so much I could say about this in such a good way because I love CRPGs. And the fact that one has become so popular and just everyone's been playing like D&D, even if they don't know it, it's just so nice, man. Like, that's just so cool. But it really is like Divinity, Larian's last game, Divinity 2, and like this weird mix of like Mass Effect where you do have like a full party, you know, and like companions with personal side quests and like the whole nine. And so I just think it's like a really cool blend. Um, and I think it's also a really good competitor for something like Pathfinder, you know? Um, so them even making this game, hopefully the next Pathfinder game is like, mm, we got to step it up, you know? So I don't know, it's just, it, it's just good. It's just good all around. I don't know. And I don't know. It's good shit. Zelda has a, it's a tough fight. And then it's like, we, you know, we're not even we're not even done with the year yet. Yeah, I think we're gonna talk about another game that's gonna be pretty bomb in a little bit. Um so I, I bought Pathfinder because Brennan was like, Oh, it's really good. And I played a little bit of it. And honestly I was like, I can see how this is good, but I was like, I don't honestly like think this is my game. And then <laughs> We talked about Baldur's Gate, and I was like, oh, like, what the fuck is this? And I was like, okay, that looks good. I'm gonna try it. Like, I'm gonna take a chance. It looks really neat. It looks like what I want Pathfinder to actually be. And so I remember being at work and texting um, Emily and being like, hey, here's the passcode to my computer. Um, here's a passcode to my Steam. Can you log in and download Baldur's Gate right now? Like, I I think I really need to play this game. So she did, and I started playing it, and I was like, oh shit. This is a lot of fucking fun. And I didn't get too far in my, my solo playthrough. Um, I, long story short, I eventually became friends with a girl named Jocelyn, and then Emily joined us. So now we have a uh, three-girl party plus a bear plus a Starian. It's either a Starian or Shadowheart. And uh, I'm romancing... Um, uh, are we doing spoilers or no spoilers? I don't know. Uh, I don't care. But I don't know if other people would care. Why not? Okay, so I'm romancing the Mind Flayer. Um, don't look at me. Um, and I'm a Dragonborn. <laughs> so well, I'm looking at you. Um. <laughs> but uh, but I... yeah, our our playthrough is absolutely crazy, and I I enjoy the game so much that I went back, recreated Olaria. Like, completely nixed my first playthrough, recreated Olaria, and now I'm playing through the game again. And I have, like, three campaigns. I have my solo co campaign, I have my game with the girls, and then I have a game with another friend. And we're, oh, we're all doing different things and handling things differently, and there's so many fucking options and different ways you can go. And it's like, none of my playthroughs have been the same. Like, at all. Like, I'll think I'm making the same choices... But, lo and behold, I am definitely not. Like, it's so... Uh, I, I love the game. Honestly, it's fucking phenomenal. I can totally see what you mean about Pathfinder, though. I think that Pathfinder is, like... It's born from a more intense rule set of D&D, where, like, 5e has become this kind of, like, mass appeal thing. I th and I think that, like, that's part of the problem, too. But that that's a different topic altogether. But... Like Baldur's Gate is so much more accessible because the rule set is simpler in a in the best way possible, right? So like it's just better. And not only that, it's like the I feel like Baldur's Gate had an easier and more simplified like tutorial. And like I 
Like, it was, it was simple. Like, for example, you wake up on the ship, you're moving around. The opening areas aren't hard. They're simple, so you can get to know the game and what you're doing. Whereas with Pathfinder, I was honestly fucking confused. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't realize that, like, my stats played into anything. I didn't even fucking realize I had stats. Like, it's just this... Baldur's Gate is very much literally 5e D&D in video game form. And it is literally the definition of that. Yeah, no, 1000%. So like, I, I wish Pathfinder was similar, but at the same exact time, like, these are games that I, I didn't, I didn't grow up on these, these types of games. So, like, my knowledge of these isn't really as vast as, like, yours. So, like, I could be just talking out of my fucking brain right now. But, like, I don't know. I don't, I don't like Pathfinder as much as I was hoping I did. But I fucking fell in love with Baldur's Gate. So much so that I persuaded Emily to buy it. And now she is, like, 60 hours into the game. And she has, like, four different fucking campaigns. And now she's mad at you because she's spending so much time in it. <laughs> oh, it's outrageous. Out, it's hilarious. So much fun when we're playing with Jocelyn. It's it, it. We're we're a mess. We are a mess. We are just shit talking each other, and we're like, "That's my man." No, that's my man. And it's it's so much fun. Because, like, we're all, like, sitting there trying to, like, strategize and, oh, I'm going to do this. Okay, well, I'm going to go over here and do this. And it's, like, it's just, it's, it's phenomenal. It's, oh, I don't, if this doesn't win game of the year, I, I, I don't want it. That I don't want this year then. I, this like has said, to fucking win game of the year. Like I said, there's one. There's two games that can compete with this, but I do think this really is going to win. I just... I think this... I... I'm going to say one more thing, and then we're going to move on so we don't get too much deeper into this. I think this had to come out during the pandemic. I think if this game came out during the pandemic... D and D would be ten times bigger than what it is. Like I understand, like Critical Role and stuff like that, and like this game has done fucking phenomenal right now. But I think if this game came out during the pandemic, where everyone was searching for something to do, this could have brought a lot of groups together. Yeah, no, going off of that really quick. I know you want to move on. This game is so good. Right now, my little brother and some of my cousins are doing a and d session because they play Boulder's Gate and now want to play D&D. I Dude, love that. It's beautiful. That is so beautiful that like a lot of these people are just getting exposed to this kind of rule set and having fun with it and being like, yeah, no, that's something you can do outside of the video game too. <laughs> Blows your mind. And it's like, nice. It's so good. And like I said, the game is so, it, it talks you through it. Like, I'm playing balanced, and it's like, yeah, I, I die a couple times here and there, but it's like, I don't I don't get mad, I don't get frustrated. I go, okay, how can I approach this fight differently? Okay, maybe instead of doing this with Shadowheart, I move her here and do this. Or maybe I swap out this spell and do that, and it's like, like, there's so many ways you can do things, and it's so forgiving. Like, it doesn't sit there and pound you into the ground to the point where you feel like you have to give up. It's like, okay, you lost. We'll try it again do something else. Like, it's just... Uh, it's so good. Best, uh, best money I spent all year. Um, yeah. Will I buy it for the PS5? Oof. Yeah. 
I I think I might. Dang. The only game I've ever bought on PC and PS on PlayStation is Diablo 3. And I've played a shit ton of Diablo 3. I get Damn. that. Okay, okie dokie, okie dokie. Before we get sucked into the Boulder Gate uh, hole, uh, we are next going to move on to Brennan's video game of the year. Brennan's, you're hearing it live. It's his pick for video oh game God. of the year. It is Stray Gods, the role playing musical. It is a role playing narrative adventure, it's a single player game. Developed by Summerfall Studios and published by Humble Games. It came out on Switch, PC, PS4, PS5, Xbox One, and Series S and X. It came out on August 10th and has a top critic average of 77, with 78% of critics recommending. Um, I'm not going to lie. I thought this game was going to do a lot worse. So did I. So I was expecting for us to look up the these uh critic averages and look at like the score the actual reviews that i'm looking at right now and um i was expecting like at the highest mid 60s for the critic averages um you know from what i'm seeing um they, a lot of people are saying the game is flawed um but a lot except for one review there's only one review that goes against what i'm about to say most people are saying that the music, you know, like the auditory um, aspect of this game is actually pretty good. I read one review where they said the music sucked, but from a lot of what I'm reading, people are saying that, um, you know, at least the music is good and the music, you know, does kind of want to keep you playing it. Yeah, I agree with Mike. I thought this was going to... I was going to do a lot worse, but I remember, I think, I could have swore I remember seeing it. Maybe it was just on Steam and it was under the new tab, but I could have swore I saw it on top selling at one point. And I was kind of surprised. And even looking at these scores now, it, it looks like some people, you know, genuinely really liked it. And then there are other people who, you know, probably, probably don't really like musicals, maybe, and then scored it accordingly. But it seems like some people really liked it, and then some people just kind of thought it was whatever. I mean, I feel like it's it's like your almost like a telltale choose your own adventure visual novel esque. Like either you're going to get with it or you're not, and it seems like a lot of people praise the cast and the songs, um, but it's the game, like the story that is what's lackluster so i mean it it hit right where i expected it to i definitely agree that it did a little bit better than what i thought it would i thought it would be in the low 70s this is around the high 70s um so yeah like i i i plan on playing this game i think i'm going to probably pick it up when it goes on sale um but i definitely want to play it because i want to hear the cast um, I want to do the romancing in this game. So, like, I, I'm curious about it. I'm very curious. And I think it did pretty decently. Um, from whatever, like, IGN gave it a 7 out of 10. So, yeah, that's that's where I expected it to fall. So It's different. And, yeah. Uh, I, I, I like that it, it is a unique idea. Um, and I like that... Um, who made it? Oh. Yeah, that's you know, Summer Fall Studios took a um risk with it. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of developers are pl kind of playing things safe right now. Um, so it's nice to see you know, developers and publishers to really reach out and do something that's not being done and something that's incredibly risky.
Uh, da, da, da. But yeah, I definitely have to agree. I think it's a good game for anyone looking for something sort of like maybe quick and easy to play right about now. I know school's about to start, so if you're looking for something just to dive into uh, for short periods of time on the weekend and not have to be so dedicated as to like something similar to Baldur's Gate, I think this is definitely one for you. Yeah. But we are now going to kick it over to, I know this is uh, the guys' favorite game, one of the favorite games that we're going to talk about, is Armored Core 6, Fires of Rubicon. Uh, it's a mech-based combat game, it's single and multiplayer, uh, developed by From Software and published by Bandai Namco. It came out on PC, PS4, PS5, Xbox One, and Series X and S. It released on August 25th and currently has a, a top critic average of 85 with 90% of critics recommending. Oh, Ooh. yeah. Yeah. A <laughs> reaction, too. <laughs> Hell, yeah. I don't know. Mike and I were talking about it before. Mike was saying that he's got it all preloaded, ready to play immediately after this. So we should wrap this up real quick because this is some good shit, dude. It's so nice that FromSoft is able to, like, not only just bang out another fantastic title, but, I don't know, just show that they know what they're doing. They're just good at what they do. Everything they do is just good. And they can keep a series running. And I think it's really cool that they brought up Armor Core 6 back to a bigger fan base and people are very receptive to it. I think that's awesome. Especially because I played the older ones, you know, back in the 90s and early 2000s. And I played the shit out of them. Like, I really enjoyed those games. So the fact that, you know, um, from software brought it back, that in itself was, you know, really cool, really cool to me. But the fact that it they took their time and made it good is what I'm really happy about. I haven't cheese it in my mouth. <laughs> um, Brennan's eating, so I will fill the space with words. Um, uh, I'm fine. No, I can talk okay. anyway. Um, <laughs> I was gonna... Brennan, fix your echoing. Fuck you. I hate it here. <laughs> yeah um it's a little different than what you would expect from from software um they even though they were doing armored core before they did you know all the souls series um you know people who pick this up because it's from software are gonna have to remember you know this is something they did before they did the souls games um and that this is going to be a game while I hear the difficulty is there, it's not going to be anything like Elden Ring or Dark Souls or Bloodborne. It's going to be something just completely different than what most From Software fans are used to. Yeah, I feel like that was similar with, not to the same extent at all, but like when Sekiro came out. Um, yeah. It was like, it's it's difficult, but in a different way. Um. And I feel like, I don't know, Armored Core, but at least when I played, when I emulated the first game, I mean, I emulated the PlayStation version. Maybe that was the only one. But yeah. I mean, there's no analog sticks on the PS1. So, like, you had to just rotation and movement was all, you know, buttons, like shoulder buttons specifically. And that was just so fucking weird to get used to. Pardon my French. And I felt like half the difficulty with the game felt like fell to the, the controls of the PlayStation One controller. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, it was kind of it was kind of punishing too. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff, at least about the first one, that I know is kind of punishing, both like in the game and outside of the game mechanically. Like having to pay for your ammo. You know, like getting set credits for a mission and then them charging you ammo and then going into like infinite debt you know and then having to like essentially sell your soul to some corporation blah 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 whatever i wonder if any of that shit's still there in this one but i think that's still kind of like it's a different kind of difficult
Um, I honestly don't have anything to say about this because I won't be playing this game. How dare you? Honestly, I just... I, I don't really have any interest in it. It looks super cool. I will 100% give you that. But I just don't... I don't think this is my sort of game. Like, it's one that I will definitely have to watch somebody play um, before I consider picking it up. I raised you right. Yeah, Shinji didn't want to get in the mech either, and look at what ended up happening to him. <laughs> I think you should get in the mech, Haley. I I think I'm going to be very hesitant to uh, get into the mech. All right. Well, if you don't, we're gonna put Mike back in, and Mike has two broken arms right now. So Mike, exactly. Mike is fine with that. He would one hundred percent be okay with that. You're really gonna um, put Mike? Oh, I hate you, Haley. Like, just get. Is it like um, Darling in the Bronx, where they have like the guy and the girl in the mech at the same time, but the girl's like in a doggy style position? What? Uh, oh, oh I gotta Google this. <laughs> I forgot what anime that is. It's a mech anime. And, like, to pilot it, they need, like, a guy and a girl. And the girl's always, like, in a doggy-style position. That's weird. Maybe it is Darling in the Franks. I haven't seen Darling in the Franks, so I can't see Oh, yeah. Book. Yeah, it is Darling in the Franks. That's hilarious. Yeah. I just remember watching that and being like, what the hell am I watching right now? But, yeah, Armored Core needs some of that. Hey. I want a big-ass drill, man. <laughs> to drill your co-pilot? With anyway, <laughs> moving on to the next game. Uh, what did we you are, just say to me? Huh? We are now talking about games that are coming up for September. To kick it off is going to be Brennan's pick of Rune Factory 3 Special. It is a simulation role playing single and multiplayer game developed by Neverland and published by Natsum uh, for North America. It's coming out on PC and Nintendo Switch on September 5th. Woo! Yeah, um, me and Brandon <laughs> were talking about this before we um, started recording. And um, I'm I'm going to be buying this. Um, I watched the trailers. And, I, you know, I told Brandon, like, I, I always wanted to get into Rune Factory. I just never did. Um... You know, I would see them on the DS. I don't, they originated on the DS. But, you know, after watching the initial trailer and then, you know, doing a little bit of research, seeing all the waifus, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to get this. So, this is a game. Um, you know, hopefully I'll be, I'll get some time into Armored Core by September 5th. Um, but I think this is something I'm going to be picking up and putting some time into. I love Rune Factory. I have never played Rune Factory 2 or Rune Factory 3. So I am especially happy about this one because I've never played it. And Rune Factory 3 is the one where the main character turns into a little sheep man. And I think that's hilarious. So, um, yeah. Rune Factory, again, for the uneducated, filthy wenches of society, it's just anime Stardew Valley. It's really, it's, it, technically, it's a fantasy Harvest Moon, if we're being super technical, because that's like the tagline it used to go by back in the day. But for you nerds, you super nerds out there, it's anime started value with better combat dungeons and story there's like actually a plot they're kind of all the same though in every single game like obviously they're they're a little different but it's all like guy with amnesia ends up in village there's conveniently 12 single hot ladies that live nearby and they all want to talk to you all the time and they they never get weirded out by you and it's like yeah this is I can, I can get into this. I can put a couple hundred hours into this. You, you grow crops. Like cucumbers and stuff, too. Wow. Yeah, I see myself putting some time into this as well. Okay, so why is it called special? 
Oh, because uh, Room Factory 3 was originally released on the DS. I have like the late mid 2010s or something. And so this special version is essentially just a uh, I'm trying to think of the word remake. It's not a remake. It's a remastering of that. And it's on the switch. Um, I'm not sure what uh, what they added outside of that, though. So you also get newlywed mode, which is standalone adventures unlocked after marriage to each of the game's 11 eligible bachelor bachelorettes and a hell difficulty uh, to challenge even veteran players. Yeah. Uh, 11 yeah. women. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. No, no, no. It's probably. um. Actually, no, it's probably 11 girls. Because they didn't start doing the gender swapping thing until... Yeah, it says Bachelorettes. Four. Yeah. The first three games were dudes. And then four was like, you could be a guy or a girl. Let me romance who I want, Nintendo. Well, they did that with five. Kind of. I was about to say, this three came out in a uh, much older time. Yeah, the gays didn't exist back then. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, God. We're I mean, terrible. We wanted, we wanted to do it, but, you know, they just didn't let us. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so that is Rune Factory 3 special. What makes it special? It's the same thing with the new coat of paint, basically. Anyway, let's talk about a brand new... IP, a lot of people are hyped for it. Honestly, I'm pretty fucking excited for this too, and I didn't think I would be. It's called Starfield. It's an action role-playing and single-player game developed by Bethesda Game Studios and published by Bethesda Softworks. It com it's coming out on PC and Xbox Series S and X um, on August... or Oh, sorry. September 6th. Um... Okay, uh, another game I'm really excited for. My wallet just hates me this month and next month. Um, but, you know, people can say what they want, but I really feel Bethesda doesn't put out necessarily bad games. Their games, yes, are flawed, but they've always been fun to me. Which, when I play a video game, that's kind of the key word I look for, is fun. Um. I saw a lot of people got early keys to this game and have been playing it. And they are really praising this game. Um, I don't know if they're kissing ass or if they're genuine, but from what I'm reading, um, it's a massive world. There's a ton of planets. You can go down onto them, and all the planets are actually, like, they're not just some, you know, um, randomized, you know, every planet is, you know, like that. Um, but they're actually they actually took the time to develop every planet that you can go on, and this could be just another game where people are gonna put eighties hours into it like nothing. I can't wait for this. I'm like <sighs> cautiously, very cautiously optimistic, though at the same time. Um. I want to jokingly say this is just Skyrim in space. I mean, like, kind of. honestly, it probably ended up. It probably will be, you know, to some extent. Is as they kind of just they not to say that they you know they only do one thing, but like like Mike said, they make good fun RPGs at the end of the day. Flawed most of the time, but you always kind of look back on them fondly, regardless of. And hopefully, Starfield will be in that, that field. It looks really interesting, though. Even just down to, like, I don't know. It's, the, having all the planets being, like, fully realized is really cool. I think it's also really funny that Tom you yeah. know, went from, like, you see that mountain? You can climb that mountain. To, you see that planet? You can go to that planet. I think it's really funny, but it's also really cool. Like, I don't know. I think the level of customization with the ship is kind of neat too. Um, 
don't know. I was watching this like deep dive, the 45 minute deep dive the other day. And like, I, I don't, I just think it'll be really unique in a way. I don't think a lot of people have tried or attempted to make something like this. And so I'm just kind of excited. I hopefully, and like even to my, as what Mike was saying before with people who played it early, uh, I hope it scores fairly well. I think Bethesda kind of needs a win, to be honest. I... This game is fucking massive. And I am so excited because, like, um... I don't know if any of you guys have played The Expanse, or, well, not played The Expanse, but watched or read the expanse but like i love that show and i bought the book because it's a book series and i'm just like this is very much giving me the expanse i'm excited to be in outer space i didn't think i would want to play this game but honestly i really want to fucking play this game will i buy it for pc or xbox is now the goddamn question probably pc because we have a series s and I know that's not going to do it the justice that it deserves. Oh, 100%. If anyone ever has the opportunity to get any Bethesda game on either PC or console, 1,000, 10 billion percent get it on PC. Yeah. yeah Mods, I would, I would agree. Mods. Mods change everything in the best way possible. They only enhance the game. You need that giant chicken. You need Thomas the the, the tank engine as a dragon <laughs> in Skyrim. If you don't oh, play that, with that, I hate you. That, that's going to be your ship. It's Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie, though. They have like a, a Series X um, themed, like Starfield themed um, Xbox and like the controller and everything. And I, I fucking love this color scheme, this red, orange, yellow, and blue. I don't, those fucking colors get me. I love those colors. Yeah, yeah. It looks really nice. So if you're going to pick up... If you want an Xbox, this is probably... You know, you've been thinking about it. You're like, I don't know if I want one. Um, This will be the good time to pick one up because, you know, from the, for, you know, from the forecasts, uh, this game's going to be pretty bomb. I think this is going to be the big win that Xbox needs. Yeah. Um, I feel like this year in particular, um, they have been very lackluster. You haven't really seen an... Well, when's the last time we got like a really good Xbox exclusive? I don't know. That silence is telling. <laughs> I was about to say we were quiet for for oh, a Halo. couple seconds. So Halo, the last Halo, which was however long ago, I have no idea. Yeah, the, I got mixed feelings about that. That when it first first dropped, it was fun, and then they just fucked it up. So Starfield is going to be, I think, their redeeming game. Listen. <sighs> After Redfall, Bethesda, I know you just published it, but, like, why did you let that out of the basement? We don't talk about Redfall. But I, I, I think it's, I think that uh, Starfield is what Xbox needs right now. It's, they, they just don't have anything else really going for them at the moment, to sit there and compete with PlayStation's exclusive lineup. And when you... Uh, right now, the the console war is the thing of the past. At least in my opinion, when somebody goes, Oh, console war. I'm not going, Oh, like, what console is better than what? I'm thinking about exclusive lineup for games. Because that's the only thing that matters anymore. It's not what hardware are you rocking. Because honestly... Y'all can just sit there and play this shit on a PC with a goddamn controller and pick your favorite controller. But it's which console do you have because of which games are your favorite. 
And in my opinion, I think Xbox has always lacked in the exclusive titles. Um, and I know that Baldur's Gate isn't an exclusive title, but I'm still looking at them when it comes to why they, they just let them release it sooner rather than later. Um, but with Baldur's Gate and Xbox, there was an issue, um, well, which is why it's not releasing on Xbox anytime soon because well, yeah. of the Xbox Series S. Yeah, like that I know and I completely understand. Um, but it's just like, I just mentioned that because it's like, I think that's, again, another point of where Microsoft is sort of shooting their self in the foot. Yeah. Like, I get it, you want to... And, and again, you can talk about this with Starfield. Are they limiting their selves as to what they can produce and put out and like the the quality of that content by having such a lackluster console like is the s holding microsoft back i think it is but that's my personal opinion I get it, you know, it's a cheaper alternative. Not everybody wants to spend, you know, 500 bucks on a console. Um, but I think buying an S, you have to realize that some games just can't handle... The S won't be able to handle what some games are putting out. I'm surprised Starfield is on the S. Um, you know, like Brennan said, I watched that deep dive. I've been, you know, watching a lot of the gameplay that's been coming out. And I'm just wondering how they're getting this to run on the Xbox S. Good question. I... Oh, I got it. You know what's a better question? What? How many licks does it take to get to the center of a tizzy pop? I hate it here. Anyway. Yeah. Um... Maybe one day we will do a deeper dive into is the S really, really fucking worth it in 2023? And in all honesty, to keep it short, I don't think it is. I think that the S is just a a little bit improved version of the Xbox uh, One S. Um, so I feel like essentially if you bought the Xbox series s you basically have an xbox one s there's not much of a big difference and yes it is holding it back because well it fucking sucks compared to the x microsoft just be like fucking playstation okay just make the same fucking console one with a disc drive one without a disc drive why you gotta be so fucking complicated why'd you have to go and make things complicated Exactly. What Mike said. YouTube, don't copyright strike us. Anyway, not to keep this going any longer, Microsoft, rethink your priorities and get back to me when you figure it out. The last game that we're talking about is Lies of P. It's a Souls-like single-player game. It's developed by NewWiz, NeoWiz Games, and published by Round 8 Studio. It's coming out on... PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Series S and X. It releases on September 19th. Now, I picked this game because I saw uh, the Rad Brad play the demo. And I was like, okay, like that looks really fucking cool. And if you're like, Haley, what the fuck is this game about? Um... Well, I will tell you, because I also had to do some damn digging. It is basically a retelling of Pinocchio. So you are a, a human-like puppet created by Geppetto, and you are in this very, like, um, post-apocalyptic world and the, um, the sort of, like, good and evil system leans more so will you turn out to be a human or will you turn into 
a puppet or a robot. Um, and it, it looks really cool. Um, some of the different, um, like, villains that they have and creatures that they have is, like, super fucking neat. Will I play this game? I really fucking want to, just because it looks so neat. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it just looks really fucking cool. All I'm gonna say is it's fucking Bloodborne with Pinocchio. However, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, Bloodborne, I don't know if people are gonna agree with me on this. Bloodborne is one of my favorite from software games. It's probably, other than Armored Core, it probably is my favorite. And I've been longing for them to do for Sony to do more Bloodborne. You know, I got the PS5 now. It's like, please, you know, make my PS5 worth it. Give me some Bloodborne. So when I was looking at this game, one, I like the story of Pinocchio. Um, not just the Disney movie. The Disney movie was one of my favorites when I was a kid. But just the actual story of Pinocchio, I love. So when I was watching this, I was like, oh, okay, it's Pinocchio, but Bloodborne. So this is a game. Um, I am gonna download the the demo, and I'm gonna check it out. Um, will I buy it when it first comes out? Probably not, just because. I mean, we already talked about two other games I'm buying in September. Um, but it is one I'm gonna keep my eye on because, like I said, I want more Bloodborne. And if Sony's not gonna give me more Bloodborne, then I may I have to go somewhere else to you know to get some. One thousand percent. I think the one thing that I find interesting is somebody else is trying. Um, like I haven't seen a lot of other like Souls like games, so I'm excited to see like how this itself compares to those games. There's not many. Um... There's not many of this like production quality. There's a lot of like shitty Soulsborne clones, but I feel like the only other one kind of like this is Mortal Shell, which was similar yet different. Um, yeah, Lies of Pedo looks pretty much like Mike said. It's like it's a nice Bloodborne substitute, um, but like almost in a different. It's like, you know, circus Bloodborne. It's like if Bloodborne had more circusy <laughs> points. And it's like, that's cool. I like that. Um, I don't know. This just, it, and it, it just, it, it looks like it's a FromSoft game, which I think is kind of impressive. And I mean that in like the best way possible. I think, uh, you know, mimicry is like the best form of flattery or whatever. Um, and I think that's what's going on here. I don't think they're intentionally trying to like, rip anything off as much as they are just i mean even this like the description of their videos at least the one that i'm looking at now it says it takes heavy inspiration i think they wear it on the, the the inspiration on their you know on their sleeve and i think that just works like i don't know i i, I do want to try the demo too like very bad yeah i think that I think the one thing that makes this game interesting is the story in itself. Like, who else is making a Pinocchio-themed dystopian world? Nobody. Exactly. Guillermo del Toro? But, but like, see, you go that route. And it's <laughs> like, Souls meets his movies equals this. This game has a lot of potential and yeah. i think if it lives up to what i've heard about like the demo and the things like that i think this this could be great i could see this game getting potentially a second one um if it does well i don't i don't know if it's going to need a sequel or not but like i i just think this can generate something like it could start something so like yeah. i'm extremely excited to see how well this does also he has a mechanical arm hello that's so what's that arm for though 
Uh, Link. Uh, Link technically has a mechanical arm too, kind of. Okay, well, this isn't Link, so. <laughs> I just well, have to throw that in. <laughs> this is Pinocchio. So Sekiro, Sekiro and, has and... one too. It's funny, we talked a lot about people that have mechanical arms today. Um, Do they have a girlfriend that wears a blue coat with blue hair? Oh. Uh, no. Okay then. Anyway, but yeah, this game looks really fucking cool. The I'm clicking through um, the trailer right now, and it's paused, and it's like the the small details that they've put into this. The porcelain looks porcelain. The gold looks gold. Like it just overall, it's a very visually appealing game and I think this has a lot of potential so I have high hopes for this game I hope a lot of people play it I'm very afraid to play it because it looks extremely hard but I guess I will just deal with it and suck it up I'll cry about it later. Anyway, uh, we are going to kick it over to our final thoughts. Sis, since this is the end of the episode for August and September, Brennan, anything that you would like to say? Um, Shadow Hearts the best. Um, anime waifus are great. Giant robots are pretty cool. And mm, uh, uh, from software is, is also pretty cool. Uh Mike, anything you would like to add? Go get lost in Baldur's Gate 3. Go pilot a mech and Mario anime waifu. Um, only thing I gotta say is, oof, Mind Flayer, I'm coming for you. I'll meet you on the other side. Gross. Ooh. love. Anyway, that is it for this episode of the Pre-Review Crew for August and September 2023. Meet us back here next month so that we can discuss with you how well Rune Factory 3 Special did, Starfield, and the Lies of Pi. To see it, or Lies of Pi, Lies of P. Lies of P. Wrong, wrong, wrong franchise, Haley. Wrong franchise. Uh, to see <laughs> if they held up against our predictions. Anyway, I hope you have a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and we will see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. I love you. They love you too. A role-playing single multiplayer game published by Larian Studios. It's on PC, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S. It released on August 3rd and has a top critic average of 97 and 100% curious recommend. Then I'm going to go, oh, yeah. Deeply oh, my God. Disturbed. Oh, my God. <laughs> you have to do that now. Can't not do it. Anyway, are we ready? No.